Dr. Nito Cubain is the president of High Point University and a nationally recognized author, speaker, and leader. Nito came to the United States years ago with just $50 in his pocket and a few words of English in his vocabulary, yet went on to become one of America's most sought after speakers and consultants. At High Point University, Nito has led the institution to phenomenal growth and significant academic achievement, tripling its size and moving it to the number one spot among best colleges in the South. As an American citizen, Nito has been the recipient of some of the highest national awards, including induction into the esteemed yeah. Horatio Elger Association for Distinguished Americans. He is the recipient of DAR's Americanism Award and the Ellis Island Medal of Honor. Nito was inducted into the International Speakers Hall of Fame and is a past president of the National Speakers Association. As a business leader, Nito is the chairman of Great Harvest Bread Company, which has 220 stores in 43 states, and he also serves on the boards of several national organizations. Nito is the author of a dozen books and scores of leadership audio and video recordings, which have been translated into many languages. The Biography Channel televised his Emmy-nominated life story titled A Life of Success and Significance. In his home city of High Point, North Carolina, Nito has been named both Citizen of the Year and Philanthropist of the Year. It's truly an honor to have him on our show, and I've certainly been looking forward to this conversation. Welcome, Nito, and thanks for joining us on Life Excellence. Brian, thank you very much. Can you repeat that <laughs> intro one more time? That'll keep me out of therapy. I'll do it this at the week. end of the show. How's that? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Nito, we're gonna we're gonna thank jump you, right sir. in, and and it really is an honor to have you. I know you're a strong proponent of higher education, obviously, but given the speed at which today's world is changing, which is faster than most college curriculums, by the way, the percentage of jobs requiring a college degree falling in the value proposition being questioned more than ever before. How is it that a formal college education is still important and justified given, especially given the ever, ever increasing cost? Oh my goodness, Brian! I, that will that, that I can answer that quickly, and I hope for, uh, hopefully persuasively. Um, if you don't have a college degree, uh, sometimes not even just undergrad, but but masters as well. In this global, competitive, ever-changing world, where the Chinese, the Indians, and others are going to college and getting advanced degrees and beating us and eating our breakfast and lunch and soon our dinner too, let me tell you, my friend, there is no question in my mind. You're looking at a guy who came to America at age 17 to go to college. My mother had fourth grade education, but she understood that there's no way I can compete measurably and persuasively and sustainably if I did not have a college education. It's not about memorizing stuff. It's not about the stuff you just learn in the classroom. It's about developing you. It's about the maturation process. It's about incubating that human being from a kid in high school to a mature individual who has a a good sense about risk management, good sense about communication with people, good sense about making decision making, finding solutions and all the rest. So to, to answer your question, yes, there's a lot of chatter out there, but the chatter is chatter. There's chatter about everything out there. And the reality of it is, yes, we should make college more affordable. I certainly would agree with that. More people ought to have the, the, the privilege to go to school, of course. There's no argument there. But there's also no question that surveys also suggest that there is a measurable segment of society, both in the United States and internationally, that understands the value of a college degree. Now, Brian, here is the point. The point is, where do you go to college? And what do you learn? And is it going to be sufficient for you to have success and significance in your own life? So at Hyper University, 99% of our students within six months of graduation Get a job, start a business, or go to graduate degree, uh, go to graduate school. The national average is 83%. Did you hear what I just said? We beat it by 16 points, my friend. Why is that? Because we're the premier life skills university. Because we say what you learn inside the classroom 
is absolutely necessary. It's a prerequisite to master the discipline in which you choose to major. However, if you do not put the frame around that Mona Lisa, the frame being, how do you make decisions? How do you get along with people? How do you lead others? How do you run your own life? How do you have the right growth mindset? All of these factors, which we at Hype University provide an ample supply by bringing more than 50 in residence people, Brian, 50 of them, people like Steve Wozniak, who's the founder of Apple Computer, people like Mark Randolph, the founder of Netflix, people like uh, the the chairman uh, 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 of the board of AT&T, the chairman of the board of Domino's Pizza, on and on the story goes. These people have done it, and they're much more capable of explaining it to students in a way that could be applicable, practical, and pragmatic. So I don't think the question is, is college worth it? I think the question is, are you going to the right school? Are you learning the right things? Are you preparing yourself for a life that is going to be more demanding? No question about it. Um, so that's that's the way I see it. Now, some of those people who argue against college, Brian, forgive me, have an agenda. Their agenda is either they're talking about, um, you know, they, they want a different kind of education, a model outside the traditional college, or they want to play the political game about colleges are brainwashing people. Not at high point. We're a God family country school. And, um, you know, we're probably slightly more conservative than not, but we have all kinds of people here. We welcome them all. We're, we're, we're very inclusive. But I do believe that students today must learn to grow from the inside out if they are to compete on a global as as our friend Tom Friedman wrote some years ago, the world is flat and we better yeah, be ready. And, for it. and I wholeheartedly agree. You're certainly preaching to the, the choir with me. I, I have some appreciation for the, the challenges in higher education because I serve on the board of trustees of a small liberal arts school here in Michigan. Nito, what are the biggest challenges facing college presidents and how will higher education need to adapt over the next, say, 10 to 20 years to meet those challenges? Well, you know, colleges and universities come in several categories, right? You have the Ivy Leagues and the like the Ivy Leagues or the hopeful to be I Ivy Leagues. They have tremendous endowments. They have all the resources in the world. Um, their challenges are more getting along with faculty, allowing resources to flow through the system, uh, dealing with regulators and, and, and legislators and so on. So we'll dismiss that group. That group has got a different, different set of challenges. Then you got this, the, the, the schools like Hyper University, slightly under that, that group. Um, doing very well. Enrollment is, our enrollment quadrupled, by the way, Brian, since I came here. As you know, I was in business for 35 years, so I'm not your typical academic, and uh, maybe I think differently, I don't know. I'm a learned person, but I'm an eternal student, and I learned a lot in business. Started six businesses, sold some of them, served on major corporations, as you said, on their boards and so on. But, but here's the thing. Uh, our type of school, which is the successful layer underneath those IVs and the big schools and the big public schools. Um, I think we're going to have challenges of, of diversity. Um, we're going to have some challenges of affordability because by definition, if we're private, we offer more services that cost more money. Everything is sure. costing more. You got to pass that on somehow, some way. Uh, affordability could be, of course, attained by giving scholarships, as you know, which we do at High Point about $82 million this year. Um, and, and, but, but also, um, the most important thing is your capacity to understand others and respect others. Um, I've been president of Hype University for 19 years now, Brian, going on my 20th year in a couple of months. I've never had one conflict with faculty. People are shocked by that. You know, I'm a business guy. I'm a, I'm a, I'm really, I'm a guy who believes in capitalism. You know, I'm a guy who you would think I'm the antithesis. Of, not at all. I respect our faculty. I appreciate them. My job is to resource them. My job is to explain why we do what we do and why we must do it this way if they're going to have sustainable careers on this, um, on this college campus or beyond. And so I think the challenge is going to be understanding others, having the ability to be agile while at the same time having the grit, the faithful courage to, to dare to take appropriate risks and, and to be innovative. You know, we're the number one most innovative school in our category, U.S. News and World Report, for eight years running. Innovation is going to be the lifeblood of survival on a college campus. And 
creating tremendous bridges of understanding with people in industry, in business, in technology, and so on, because those are where the jobs where the jobs are. We have 4,800 companies related to us at Hypo University giving internships to our students and so on. Then you have the third layer. The third layer is the small liberal arts school um, that has, you know, 1,000, 1,500 students. They have no critical mass. Unless somehow the heavens open up and someone gives them a ton of money, uh, they will struggle. And what happens is as you struggle to make a balanced budget, you start deferring maintenance. So when I came to Hype University, we had $120 million in deferred maintenance. We only had 1,400 students. We were 91 acres landlocked in the middle of a, a city. And we had 100, um, 100 faculty members and only had three academic schools. Today, we have 13 academic schools, 550 acres in the same location in the city. Uh, our budget went from 28 million to 500 million. And our students come from all 50 states and 50 countries. Why is that? That's the question we should be addressing. What must these colleges do to transcend, transcend the challenges of the present to ensure a better and more uh, more promising future. I really appreciate everything you shared, and we, we could certainly make this all about um, the college campus and academics and education. And I'm I'm fascinated by the topic, but I I want to make sure um, for our listeners that we cover some other things too. So let's back up a little bit. Your story, Nito, is a classic example of the American dream. Tell us what it was like for you growing up and moving to the US at the age and at the age of 17 I think and how that changed your life well, Brian, my father died when I was six years of age. I never really had a dad because before that he was sick for three or four years. My mother only had fourth grade education. She was left with five kids. I was the youngest of five. Uh, she had to learn to be a seamstress to make money so she can feed us and clothe us. But her greatest gift to us was instilling um, principles and fundamentals in our life. I call it planting seeds of greatness in the hearts, minds, and souls of other people. That's what I try to do every day at Hype University. And so my mother wanted me to have an education. She borrowed money and sent me on a one-way ticket to America. And I came to America because America was the land uh, of the free and home of the brave. But more importantly, it was a land where if you want to work hard enough or smart enough, uh, challenges may be in the way. There may be some tough times and rocky roads, but you can do it. And so I came here and worked my way through college, man. I worked six, eight hours a day to go to college seven days a week. And I went to a small school in Eastern North Carolina, then transferred to what was then High Point College to the High Point University in High Point, North Carolina. And, um, and I'll tell you what, I was scared. I was homesick. I was broke. But out of adversity, my friend, can emerge abundance. Sometimes the rocky roads will lead you to well-paved highways. You just have to be willing to have an open heart for it. Uh, you mentioned I'm in the Horatio Alger Association of Distinguished Americans with some fabulous people, unbelievable human beings. I, you know, I have to pinch myself and say, how did I get in there? But that's all about people who had tremendous adversity and overcame them, like Colin Powell, for example, and became you know, someone of, of means and someone of great reputation, or Howard Schultz, founder of Starbucks, uh, or, or Truett Cathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A, people of that ilk. And so my adversity, I thank God for it, because it made me a stronger human being. It allowed me to deal with life in a, with much more, with much greater uh, courage and a much deeper uh, uh, faith. I'm a man of faith. I, I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. I have a I, I believe in God Almighty, and I, it's by the grace of God and the help of others I've done anything in my life, uh, been able to achieve anything in my life. And I'll never forget that. I carry with me a little card that says, enjoy the gifts, keep your eyes on the giver. And so, um, yeah, I mean, that's my story. You know, I came out of graduate school, Brian, and had $500 and audaciously started my first business. I never worked for anybody. Started my first business, a direct mail business. You know, what did I know about it? I made, I made mistakes and I made some victories along the way, had some victories. I had 68,000 clients in 32 countries in a matter of two and a half years. And that's how my speaking career came to be, out of that. People buying my stuff start saying, 
come speak to us. Before you know it, I was doing 200 speeches across the country. I mean, are you kidding me? I was 27 years of age. And I was making $200, $500 a speech, but hey, I was in demand. And of course, that led to me being uh, in great demand as a, as a speaker, a thousand inquiries and invitations a year. And um, later on, at very, very high fees, I might say, thank you, God. Uh, because, you know, if you make money, the question is not whether or not you make money. The question is what you do with it. And if you are a benefactor, if you're a steward, then you make the world a better place. Then the more resources you have, time, energy, intellect, money, all those are resources, you can share them with others in very meaningful ways. And we've done some amazing things here in the city, my family and I, and I thank God for the opportunity of doing that. So while my life was tough, I was able to start businesses. You know, I owned a company called Great Harvest Bread Company, 240 stores around the country and so on. But you know what, Brian? The most important advice you can give people came from my mother. She said, if you want to be great, you must first walk hand in hand and side by side with great people. In other words, who you spend time with is who you become. She said, what you choose is what you get. So don't blame the world and the government and everybody else for your, for your lot in life. Hey, you made choices, man. Stand up and own them. And then she would say, how you change, not if you change, not when you change, but how you change is how you succeed. I took that to heart. And I hung around people. Sometimes I couldn't get to them, you know, in person, but I read their books. Um, you know, I, I watch them on YouTube or wherever. I still read, by the way, two books a week. You'll be surprised. I still read, you know, motivational books, leadership books, philosophy books. And I get up every morning between three and four in the morning and I study for two and a half hours before I ever come to work. I think school is never out for the pro. That's why I love a podcast like this, because somebody listening to us today, that a life will be enriched because of something you or I will say or something that will happen to them as a result of just being with you on this podcast. So I'm grateful for my life, Brian. I'm grateful for the wonderful people I've met along the pathways of my life. But I am not finished. Far from it. God has called me to do some significant things. And uh, I choose to be extraordinary, and and there's a lot more to do, and and I'm set up for it. I, I appreciate that, and there's so much packed into what you just said. I don't even know where to begin. I want to make sure that I uh, mention that your mother is such an amazing woman. First of all, um, secondly, the the adversity you you had. Uh, adversity, especially earlier in, in your life. And as you know, it, it, the, we learn more some, sometimes, a lot of times from adversity than we do um, from success. So certainly, I, I know you'll agree that that really shaped you early on and has helped you to become the person that you've become. And, and then your speaking career, I definitely want to get into that. And the reason for that, Nito, and you don't know this about me, but that's how I first became aware of you back in the, all the way back in the 1990s. It's hard to believe it's been that long. <laughs> but at the time I was studying and learning from people like Brian Tracy, Zig Ziglar, Jim Rohn, and Les Brown. And I came across one of your books, which I still have today. It's called Stairway to Success, if you recognize yeah. this. <laughs> and yeah. you tout that as being the complete blueprint for maximum personal and professional achievement in the 21st century. And I think I actually heard you speak one time. There was a, a gentleman years ago in Detroit named Michael Jeffries, and he had a, a, yes, an yes, organization yes. called Yes, a Positive Network. Do you recall speaking yes. at one of those events? I, um, Michael Jeffries um, did the program uh, in Detroit, and I probably spoke 10 times there. That was a public seminar where you bought a subscription or a ticket to come hear us speak there. And I, by the way, Brian, I did that in about 30 cities around the world with different promoters, just like people promote concerts today. In those days, there were a lot of those kind of seminars. So I spoke in about 30, 40 countries around the world, and all those people you know, bought tickets, you'll have 1,000, 1,500 people there come to hear you speak for three hours. All those people you mentioned are buddies of mine. Of course, we've lost Jim, sure. we've lost Zig, but um, Les and Brian are still active. And, um, and uh, believe it or not, I was, I was in the business before Jim, uh, right about the time Zig got in. Uh, Les, Les came way after that. 
And Brian came a few years after that. So I, because I started at age 25, start speaking, you know, so. Um, but look, books are important. I wrote about a dozen books like the one you just showed. Um, I wrote another book. <clears throat> Remind me in, in February or March, I'll send you a comp copy on it, about what I've done at High Point University. And I talked about the models and the principles that I've done. It's, it's autobiographical, but it's a very interesting book that's applicable to any business. Um, but I've been lazy in the last uh, 10 years, not writing. And, you said and busy, right? Write not lazy? Busy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I like to say I've been productively busy. You can be, you can be busy and waste time. But, um, but, you know, I love to write. It comes easily to me, but you have to focus on it. And... Um, you know, we've all been influenced by books we read and people we met. And and so in the 1990s, 80s, really mid-80s, about mid-80s and into the mid-90s, um, uh, I was second bestseller with Nightingale Conant. Uh, Dennis Waitley was number one. I was number two. I had eight programs with him. One of my programs called How to Be a Great Communicator, later later Communicate Like a Pro, Um which sold more than a million books in, 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 you know, in print. But with Nightingale Corner, sold more than $20 million in cassettes. Remember cassettes? So, so believe it or not, Brian, this will, this will find shocking. I have parents who come to Hyper University and sometimes grandparents who say, you know, I'm bringing my kid here because 30 years ago, you know, I, I came to your seminars. I listened to your stuff. I read your books. And then some of my donors, this is, it's a wonderful story. Someday I hope to write about it. Uh, a guy came to me one day, gave me millions of dollars, and he said, you, you don't know me from Adam, but every single day on my way to work, I listened to one of your cassettes. And I was a, a nothing guy just starting out. And today I'm, I'm, I'm worth $100 million. And I just remember what you did for me when I needed the most. God at work, Brian. God at work. That that's awesome, and you've certainly made an impression on thousands and thousands of people. And you're doing that today in a different way. I I wanted to make sure that I mentioned. So I don't remember what you spoke about when you used to come to Yes. Um, but, <laughs> I don't remember but, but either. I'll tell Brian. you what I do remember very distinctly, and the impression you made on me at the time and ever since was that when I first saw you, Nito, I immediately identified you as the best dressed person I had ever seen at the time. And I'm not kidding about that. I'm serious. And I'll, I'll tell you why that's <laughs> important to me. It made an impression on me. And, you know, around that time, there was a book. Um, Dress for success, and and that was a, a very big thing at the time that you were doing it. But nobody I, that I knew of, I'm sure there were other people. Nobody that I knew of was dressing as nicely as you, and that made an impression on me. And and I uh, tried to that it impacted me, and it impacted the way that I dressed. Why, if you could yeah. share, is that is it always been important, and even today you yeah. have a, a white shirt well, very nice look, tie why is it important to you and and especially i'm a, I'm a cufflink and, guy and, i'm a cufflink and guy. you've always had cufflinks cuff and um, shiny shoes and nito you know yeah. that today tech billionaires are walking around in jeans and hooded sweatshirts but you're not doing that no and none of my executives on this campus do that all of my deans, all of my vice presidents, everybody. We, we don't have a dress code, but it's in the culture. This is, the answer is simple. You know, first impressions are lasting impressions. Point number one. Number two, what are you modeling for others? Now, you don't have to wear a tuxedo, and you don't have to wear a tie if you don't want to. Um, I'm in my office, so I don't have my jacket on. Uh, you have a beautiful you. jacket on. But, but I wear, you know, today I speak... Um, I speak at noon, I speak at four o'clock, and I speak at seven o'clock at different events in town. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, have, I always have a tie on and a, and a, and a jacket on. I, you know, I invested in fine clothing even when I didn't have enough money to do so. I believe that buying one good suit um, is better than buying three that are cheaper suits. So I've always had tailored clothing. My shirts are tailored. My, my suits are tailored. Um, and, um, 
and, and so number one, it's it's you know first impressions. Number two, it's what are you what are you modeling for other people? But number three, it makes me feel good, Brian. It makes me feel good when I get up in the morning, take a shower, shave, dress up in a clean shirt. I put a little starch in my shirt. It even makes me feel better. I don't like cuff. I don't like cuffs that are all wrinkled up and all that. You know, I like to have them. So, so that's just me. Now I don't impose that on others if they wish to do otherwise. Um, by the way, if you saw me at the beach, <laughs> I'm barefooted, shorts, T-shirt, right? You know what I mean? But I'm on a private beach doing my own thing, relaxing. So there's a time for everything. But I think the question is bigger than that. And, and the question is, um, you know, garbage in, garbage stays. Wisdom in, wisdom stays. So the question is, what do you want to put inside your brain? Sure, for sure. I only watch maybe 20 minutes of television unless it's, sports then i can watch a two-hour uh, basketball game i watch two or three in a row if i could um and i do in march you know <laughs> march madness but otherwise i'm not interested in all that you know i i'm a selective viewer and i can do it on my iphone or my ipad and select what i want to to to, to watch and, and i like to learn that's my last point on that i like to learn from people who whom I respect. For me, authenticity above charisma any day of the week. And if I respect you, then I want to learn from you. And in my life, the people I seem to respect the most were people who did something with their life. But more importantly, Brian, this is a big point for me. And I hope it's for those who are watching us today. I don't think life is about legacy. You know, people say to me, oh, look at your legacy. Look what you built. Look what you've done. Look what... I go, no, life should never be about legacy. Legacy is so selfish. It's like what people think of me. Life ought to be about mm -hmm. impact. What happens to you because we somehow cross paths? Not what I did in my life and therefore you like what I did and therefore I become more famous or more, more admired somehow. And so for me, the people that I believe impacted the world the most uh, and I'm not saying there are not exceptions to what I'm, I'm suggesting. I don't have all the answers to all the questions. But the people who really influenced my heart uh, were people who seemed to always be respectful of others. And part of dressing nicely when you have an important meeting is to respect others. If I showed up today, you know, unshaven, my hair is going in every direction, I had an old shirt on, uh, that shows no respect to you or to your program. Now, that's philosophy. It's what I believe. I'm not suggesting everyone should believe that. Having said that, I tell every student on our campus here, look, you want to make a good impression. You want to go into that interview ready with a beautiful suit on, shirt, tie, polished shoes, and you want to be a good listener. And you want to do your homework about the company before you ever go there. Instead of asking questions, what are my benefits? What's my vacation? Be talking about how you can make that company a better place. Can I give you one concept that I think would be uh, uh, worth anybody of watching course. this whole program? The concept is about value. Because that's what we're talking about, right? How to become mm -hmm. a more valuable person. Here's, here's a misconception. I hope to write a book about sometime about contrasts. Like I just gave you the contracts. Uh, legacy versus impact. Uh, so I have another contrast. You know, I have con con contrast like like uh, selling versus persuading, communicating versus connecting, success versus significant. Sure. You know that kind of thing. Um, so, or uh, training versus education. But here's here's a really powerful concept that I've been speaking about a lot, and people really set up and take note of it. And that is everybody talks about rendering value, as if that's Unique, as if, you know, when you render a value, you're really special. You're not. Every person renders some kind of value. Every person renders some kind of value. The good, the bad, the indifferent. The issue is not about value. The issue is about appreciated mm. value. Let me illustrate. Let me illustrate. If I were to say to you, Brian, you just won two first-class tickets to go to Maui, and uh, all expenses paid, and then I'm going to give you two weeks on a cruise ship around the, the Hawaii Islands and beyond, and uh, all expenses paid. However, 
You cannot transfer those to anybody. You cannot sell them on eBay. You must use them yourself. Now, you would agree with me that has a lot of value, right? The cost of the tickets, the cost of the cruise, thousands of dollars of value. But if Brian were afraid of flying and Brian got motion sickness on that cruise ship and therefore he wouldn't dare get onto a ship, that would not have appreciated value. It simply would not have appreciated value. In other words, the gift had value, but to Brian, no, I don't want to be on that airplane. I don't want to be on that cruise ship. And since I can't do anything else with those tickets, they have value, no argument. But for me, they have no appreciated value. So therefore, the most powerful thing we can focus on every day in every way with every person we encounter is, am I providing appreciated value? We, we, know, we know we're giving value, but is it appreciated value? So as I'm speaking with you this morning, I'm not focusing on what I'm saying. I'm focusing on that camera, looking in the eyes of that person watching us and saying to myself, I, I, am I providing something for everybody watching us so they can walk away with something of appreciation? And the only way you provide appreciated value is to understand other people's needs, goals, fears, and aspirations. And if every salesperson in America understood that simple principle, you understand people's fears, needs, goals, and aspirations, you will provide greater value, appreciated value. And guess what happens when you provide appreciated value? People come back again and again and again and again, and you go from brand awareness, everybody's talking about branding, branding. What is branding? It's nothing. What really matters about branding is brand advocacy. When you advocate that product, that service, that's when you have the richness of brand. People can know your brand. I, I'm familiar with Pepsi brand, but I don't drink Pepsi. So that means nothing. So brand advocacy is the name of the game. And, and so appreciate value is what we all ought to be seeking to provide. The world will change. And when people say to me, how do I become wealthy? How do I become financially independent? How do I become, you know, whatever? I go, you don't focus on that. You focus on being a person of purpose. You focus on the other person. You provide great things to others and watch what happens. Brian, let me give you a compliment. You're a great listener. I do a lot of these podcasts. You, you let me flow with what I'm talking about. Um, so many people just, you know, they just want to jump all over the place. At the end, the, the, the reader or the viewer didn't really get value. You listen intently, and I'm aware of the fact I give you long answers because I'm trying to provide appreciated value to that person watching us, and I don't know which idea is going to hit what person where in their life, but hopefully at the end of it, every person watching us will get something out well, of Well, and this. I have no doubt that that's the case, and I love the distinction between value and appreciated value, and also the example that you gave, because I think that really illustrates how we might be offering something that we perceive as valuable, but if it's not valuable to the recipient, then that's not appreciated value. So that's terrific. And you've shared lots of other things. I, I love talking about dress. And, and, and to me, that's very serious. You sort of chuckled when I brought it up, but it, it's very serious and very important to me. And, and from my standpoint, that's part of the, the notion of surrounding yourself with success. And so we think about yep. people, and, um, but I expand that to environment and certainly surrounding your body with success. And you mentioned how you feel when you're dressed a certain way. And I, I think that feeling then gets exuded onto other people. And in the, the fact that I brought that up is the one thing that I remember when I first met you back in the 1990s, that was 30 years ago, Nito. And that was appreciated value, and that made a lasting impression on me. So I appreciate that. Well, thank you, thank I, you I very much. I want to jump back thank into you, the book just for a second, Stairway to Success. And I know you've written many other books. And what I really liked about this book, and it was published over 30 years ago, is that the blueprint for success is timeless. So the strategies that you wrote about yes. in 1996 are just as true today as they were then. And 30 years from now, 
they'll still be true. I, I wonder, and you've given lots of value already, lots of appreciated value and, and some nuggets, but what are just a few keys to maximizing personal and professional achievement? Well, um, number one is a growth mindset. You know, Carol um, Dweck at Stanford wrote this book called Mindset. She made the difference between fixed mindset. That's the way we've always done it. That's the way I feel comfortable doing it, to growth mindset. W what is the potential? Where can I go? What can I do? How we improve this every day? Number two, it's, it's um, and that, by the way, under that, you can put attitude and all of that, um, positive thinking, etc. And the second one is commitment. And I, I talk about that in this book, Stay With Success. Commitment. Commitment is one of the most important steps in life because you can make a decision with your brain, but you must make a commitment with your heart. That's why commitments are longer lasting. That's why commitments are harder to break. So a lot of people say, I'd like to do this. I'm planning to do it. That's not commitment. Commitment is I will give it everything I got. After I've done my homework, I know this is the right thing to do, uh, you know, et cetera. I will give it everything I got. You know, as president of Hype University today, um, people are shocked when I tell them my easy days are 12 hours. But more often than not, it's 16, 18 hours. But I don't think it's work. I think it's a lot of fun. You know, I, I, I got up this morning about 3.30. I stayed home till 7. I had coffee with my wife. I came here about 8.20. And um, I'll go home tonight about 9 o'clock. So what is that? That's 9 to 9 is 12 plus about 5, 6 hours. That's 17 hours. You know, some people go play golf for four or five hours. This is, this is what inspires me. So um, I'm committed to the work. I'm committed wholeheartedly to the work. So that's, that's number one is growth mindset. Number two is commitment. Number three is leadership. So what is leadership? Leadership doesn't mean you're going to be the CEO of the company. Leadership means you conduct yourself in a way that other people would choose to be on your team. And that entails everything from your capacity to connect with people, not merely communicate with them. You communicate by speaking, listening, observing, writing. But when you connect with people, you, you're talking heart to heart. You're, you're speaking in language they can immediately immerse themselves in. And the only way you can do that, as I've already illustrated, is to know their fears, their needs, their goals, their aspirations. And um, so leadership is a big deal. And number four is just understanding, you know, knowing that, you, nobody appointed you the king of the world, and you can't be a dictator. Now, you should be a person of purpose, and you should be clear on what you want to do because people want to follow clear leaders. Um, but that doesn't mean you, you have all the answers. And, and understanding others is a great gift. The reason I've had no issues with faculty on our campus is because I say, what is it that would make them happy? What is it that will make their life more successful? And how can I give them as much of that as I possibly can within the realm of, of ethics and, 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 and policy of the university and so on? That's not difficult to do. But since most of us are self-oriented, right? We're self-oriented. What's in it for me? You know, uh, well, how can I benefit from this? So we missed the point. And, and I think what we need to be, we, we can't just have self-interest, Brian. We have to have enlightened self-interest. And the difference between the two is that self-interest is all about me. Enlightened self-interest is how can I help you first? Because if I help you first, you'll help me. It's, uh, you'll, be, you'll be surprised how much of my time I invest in just serving others like I'm doing with you this morning. And um, it's not that I have the time, it's I make the time. But it's an amazing thing that happens. You know, you could say something to someone down the road, I'll never know that it was you who said something to them. But as a result of you doing that, it leads to something else that benefits my life or my university's life or my family's life or my country's life. And so um, that's what I believe wholeheartedly. And I think the older we get, Brian, the more we begin to understand that premise about, about truly acknowledging other people, that they exist and they are important, and I have to understand them first. So the analogy I give is if you're crossing a bridge, most of us communicate in this fashion. I'm at this end of the bridge. There's a river down here. You're at the end of this end of the bridge. And most people relate to it as uh, I start where I am and I start coming to you. No, no. 
you know, stay where you are and slowly start bringing people to you. And the only way you can bring people to you is to get to know them and understand them. So you're forcing yourself to immerse yourself into the heart of that person. Who are they? What do they value? What is important in their life? How can I help them? Slowly they start coming to you. And before you know it, you know, you, you, you're seen as a really good leader and they give you all these names and all these titles. But the reality of it is you're just a normal guy who's trying to help other people. And so these are, these are some of the things. Now, of course, there are other factors like skill and experience uh, and competence. I don't mean to dismiss those. What, whatever you do, you must do it in the best way you can. I taught myself how to speak English in a fluid fluent and flowing manner. I also taught myself to think with clarity. So I'm looking into the camera the whole time. I have no notes. I have no idea what the questions are. If you send them to me, I don't look at them, just so you know. Um, I, I'm an impromptu guy, but I know my stuff. I'm competent in my area, therefore I have confidence. So whatever question you ask me, I have a, uh, a, a significant amount of uh, knowledge uh, on that on that on that issue or i will focus on the area i have the most knowledge on and so um those are not common traits and if i get my students to do more and more of that speak precisely speak with clarity uh focus and appreciate value i'm telling you everything else follows uh, awards will follow money will follow significance will follow everything will follow and it may not follow on your timeline, mind you, you might have to exercise some patience. I always say there's no such thing as unrealistic dreams. They're only unrealistic timelines. So we have to be patient. And that's why we should never do something and expect something in return. William Barclay, the Scottish theologian, said, always give without remembering. Always receive without forgetting. Wow, I love that. Just do good, do good every day and expect nothing in return. But somehow the world will take care of your return when you least expect it. I, I love that. And you mentioned that the part about adding value to others and, and helping others, that that comes later in life. But I'm going to suggest that you've been doing that. You're certainly most of your adult life and as long as I've known you. And it, it's one thing to have those things for yourself, right? To create success for yourself, for your family, for those closest to you. It's quite an, another and, and a, a bigger opportunity, I think, to, to make impact on other people. And, and, by, and you've done that in some very big ways in your companies at High Point University. But the other thing to remember for our listeners and viewers is that we have the opportunity every day to positively impact people, to, to make a difference in the lives of people through simple, um, random acts of kindness, just being nice to people, just saying good morning to somebody when you yeah. pass them on the street in the morning, um, using somebody's name if, you, if they have a name tag or if you know their name. And those are very small ways that we can just be kind, be nice to people. And we don't know what's going on with people in, in the moment. And sometimes those very small, seemingly insignificant things that we do, the, those kind gestures that we offer can have an impact. You, you talked about impact. If I go and say something about this show and, and the, the, um, the, the ripple effect that that has. But sometimes yes. we do something that for us is insignificant. It doesn't seem very big, in, but the impact that has, to, to use your word from earlier in the show, the impact that has on somebody. And, and by the way, we, we don't know what that is. And it's okay that we don't know what it is, but we do have those opportunities in, in small ways, and hopefully we have them in big ways too. You know, yes, sir, light a candle every way, the, every way you can. Nito, your school's marketing material touts High Point University as the premier life skills university. One aspect that mm -hmm. I really enjoyed reading about in preparation for this show is the role of both su success and significance in life. And, and you mentioned a number of contrasts, and so I'll bring that contrast to you. 
what is the distinction between success and significance? And why is it important for you to teach that lesson? And I know you do that in your first year seminar on life skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah. um, So success is focused on the three F's, fans, fame, fortune. Significance is focused also on three F's, your faith, Mm -hmm. your family, your friends. So success Success is defined differently by different people, Brian. You know, uh, an entrepreneur might say success is making a lot of money. Um, um, Albert Einstein might say, might say success is unraveling the secrets of the universe. Um, let's see, Mother Teresa might say success is feeding the hungry in the back alleys of Calcutta. Um, you know, um, Hank Aaron might say success is being the record of Babe Ruth. I mean, everybody looks at success in a different way based on their own perspective of life. But significance is about a deeper understanding of what life is. You come from the salt of the earth, you go back to the salt of the earth. None of us is going to live forever. So what is it that you do in life that matters and matters not just to you and to immediate inner circle, but to the world at large? And so that to me is what significance is. It's about impact. It's about impact that lives on long after you're gone. They may not quote you, by the way. They may not even remember your name. That's not important. What is important is that you've done something to propel someone forward in some meaningful way. That's what significance is to me. So, you know, one is about one is about secular things, success. Buy a big house, have a big boat, a nice car. And one is about spiritual. However you define your spirituality, about spiritual things. Spirituality suggests that I am not enough. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there is something much bigger than me. Um, and, and, uh, and I believe it in my heart, and it enriches my personhood. I, I love that. I, I want to ask you about learning, and I know you're a lifelong learner. I'm a learner. That's one of my strengths. I, I've been, we have a phrase in our family, always learning, always growing. And that plays out for me through reading books and listening to audio programs and podcasts and attending seminars and, and having conversations with people like you, frankly. I, I think it was Jim Rohn who said, formal education will make you a living. Self-education will make you a fortune. And I sense that your <laughs> yeah. focus on life skills, and that's something I really picked up on in, uh, again, preparing for the show, was the focus <laughs> at, at High Point University on life skills. I sense that that focus yeah. is ad- addressing the second part of Jim's quote. How important is lifelong learning to you personally? You touched on that a little bit earlier. And how is that important? How is that it, uh, importance conveyed to to students at High Point University? Well, you're right. I teach all the freshmen here, um, 1,600 of them, every Thursday morning. We talk about leadership and stewardship and and, uh, communicating and so on and so forth, Uh, fiscal literacy, et cetera. But look, uh, school is never out for the pro. Just like you take a bath every day, shower every day to cleanse your body, you must cleanse your mind. The world is changing so fast. Information is coming at us so rapidly that if we don't catch up with what's going on, we're going to be left behind. So to that extent, we have to constantly be learning, 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 learning. Now, the irony is learning today is easier than it's ever been before because it's so accessible. Um, On the other hand, learning today is more difficult than ever before because it is so accessible, so there's a lot of misinformation out there too. And one has to develop the, the capacity to be discerning about what is and what isn't and what's reasonable and what's unreasonable. And so uh, to me, the whole notion of um, living life fully is to make sure that every day you're learning. If all you have is information, people use you and discard you. If all you have is knowledge, people call upon you only when they need you. But if what you have is wisdom, people respect you. And the only way you can attain wisdom and grow it and feed it and harvest it is to constantly be learning because what you thought was the, the case may not be the case anymore. We used to think the world is flat, and then we found out it's not. And so we have to learn somehow, some way, that uh, what I knew yesterday may or may not be as applicable tomorrow. And the only way I know it's going to be applicable tomorrow is to keep myself up 
with what's going on all around me. That's terrific and vitally important in in my opinion. And I know we share that. Nito, we have a mutual friend, John Maxwell. And I know John has visited yes. High Point several times. He's taken groups of leaders yep. to see the good work that you're doing. And I think he's spoken there too. And your students mm. have also been exposed to other well-known leaders and innov- innovators. And you talked about some of those people, guys like co- Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak. I'm a yes. big believer in, I mentioned this earlier too, in surrounding yourself with success, which of course includes mm-hmm. learning and being mentored by successful people in various domains of life. So it's not just business or success or wealth. I, I study people who have long-term relationships and, and marriages and study uh, people who are, I think, are great parents to learn more about um, how to be a great dad. Share your thoughts on the importance of surrounding ourselves with success and the difference that that's made in your own life? Well, um, I think the primary difference is that um, you to understand that you don't have everything you need to thrive in life. And that what you need to do is to access that uh, and multiply it through the lives of others. Because each of us travels a different path and life can be difficult. And... Um, so as, as Dr. Peck wrote in his book, you know, um, The Road Less Traveled, he began by saying life is difficult. Well, life can be difficult, but through difficulty can also come tremendous progress. And so the only way we can do that is to, is to sort of learn it through other people. That's point one. Point two is perspective. Perspective is everything. The way we look at things come through our prism of perspective. Uh, we might, you and I might look at the same thing and see two different things entirely. And so uh, by learning about other people's perspective, I begin to find out that there are other ways I can look at this issue. And I go, hmm, I never thought of it that way. So that's another reason why we have to learn through others. The third reason is some people have done the impossible. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, you look at your iPhone today and you go, if it weren't for Steve Wozniak in his garage creating Apple One, we wouldn't have the iPhone today. Wow, are you kidding me? This is unbelievable. How did they do that? How did they build? How did True with Kathy begin with one chicken store in Atlanta and built it into a twelve billion dollar business? Um, and they close on Sunday. <laughs> I mean, go figure. So um, th- there are many reasons why it's important to walk hand in hand and side by side with others. And sometimes you don't disagree. You don't, you don't agree with everything they say. That's okay too. You got to be discerning. But you can learn something from everybody. And I think I think widening our horizon through the podcasts we listen to, through the books we read, the seminars we attend, I'm a believer in all of that. You spoke of John, John Maxwell. He's one of my dearest friends. <clears throat> in fact, I'll have dinner with him in about two, three weeks down in Palm Beach. Um, John is an amazing person, just amazing person. Uh, we're about the same age, and he is going at three times the pace I go at. And he's in, he's in Peru at the moment. I mean, go figure, this guy is like, a, uh, is like a, 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 what do you call it? The energetic <laughs> the bunny or something bunny. like that. You know, <laughs> energize the bunny, yeah. He's an amazing guy. He also speaks about complex issues in very simple terms so people can comprehend what he's talking about. He also focused on one area and became an expert in it, leadership. And he also multiplied what he does through all kinds of educational systems and, and licensing and, and, and all of this stuff. So, I mean, he you talk about impact. This guy created enormous impact. He also did it in different sectors, in the commercial sector, the business sector, institutional sector, Religious sector is incredible. So um, I see John with some frequency, and he's one of our in residence at High Point. So he comes here every year, um, and I learn from him every time. And I've shared the platform with him many times. Um, he's just uh, he's he stops in my in my book. As was Jim Rohn. I knew Jim very well. Zig was one of my very good buddies. When Jim was fifty, I was twenty five, and uh, and I got to know him and learn from him. Uh, Zig was a very fine Christian man, and and everything he did was based on the values and principles that he he believed in fundamentally. And um, 
you know, all these guys are just, you know, unbelievable people who do amazing things, but the world is filled with them, filled with them. You can't look north or south, east or west without seeing them. The question is to be open to it and be re- at the receiving end of yeah. it willingly. Yeah, that's terrific. And I appreciate you sharing those nice words about John. He is a great man. And and by the way, he feels the exact same way about you, as you know, which um, is why you have a, a great relationship, I think. I, I want to ask you one more academic question. What do you enjoy most about being a college president? So you're in business your whole life, oh. speaking, and yeah. then... Um, came full circle. You were a graduate of High Point University and had the opportunity and the privilege to become not just a college president, but but president of High Point University, your alma mater. What do you enjoy most, though, about being a college president? Well, yeah, my answer is very, very clear on that. It's, it's the most important work I think I've ever done in my life. It is taking a group of people, 1,600 of them as freshmen coming into this campus, and helping to mold them into the future leaders of the world and planting seeds of greatness in their hearts, their minds, their souls. And by the way, something I didn't expect through osmosis reaching Mm. their parents too, because I speak at all the parental events here and so on. I have more emails from parents telling me they've learned stuff from us or they appreciate what we're doing or, you know, they advocate us like you won't believe. They're generous. They give us gifts like you wouldn't believe. I mean, last year, just three families gave us $100 million at High Point University uh, to build a law school, build a dental medicine school, to build a new library. I just am grateful to that every single day. I don't get up in the morning thinking about how to do that, but it just happens because, as I said, impact is what it's all about. So, um, and these, these, you know, we graduate 1,500 of them every year. They go on to do amazing things. And then I get all these emails and letters from people. Um, um, alumni who say, man, when I was in your class, I didn't fully appreciate what you were saying, but now that I'm out there in the real world, Lord have mercy, I really realize what you did for me while I sat there and listened to you. And if I can, if I can encourage a young um, person to think that they can, that God created them for a purpose, that they are extraordinary, so don't mess it up, Wow. In an age today where young people are questioning who they are and why they exist in so many cases, we're able to turn that around. Is there a better word than that, Brian? I think well, not. Well, I certainly love being on college campuses and, and the energy that I feel every time I have the opportunity to interact with young people, generally speaking, but specifically on college campuses. You know, we talk a lot about the youth today and their uh, work ethic and, yeah. and other things, but every time I'm on a college campus around college students, I, that just all goes out the window and I'm, I'm energized and very enthusiastic about the future of our country and yes, the future sir. of our world. Absolutely. Nito, our show, as you know, is called Life Excellence, and you certainly model the concept of excellence. Mm -hmm. I I wonder, what does excellence mean to you? Excellence means, um, a better word is extraordinary than excellence, but but, um, uh, excellence means being um, better than the norm, um, being way above average, but mostly excellence means the fulfillment of your own potential. So excellence for person A might be very different than person B. Um, you may be a great mathematician, and I may never be a great mathematician, but I could be great at something. So whatever that is, then seek to do it at your very, very best. And people will know that you're excellent when you impact their life and, and bring appreciated value. And, and the key is not to be excellent. The key is to be sustainably mm. excellent, repeatedly excellent, where that becomes part and parcel of your very existence, very personal. I, I love that distinction. And you, you mentioned that extraordinary, and I know that's a word that you use at high point, is even better than excellence. Life extraordinary, I don't, it, it just doesn't have the same ring as life excellence. So we might, we might stick with <laughs> life excellence. But but you mentioned contrasts, and, and so I, I don't want to leave without asking you about this. How do you contrast excellence and extraordinary? Well, um, excellence... Seems like a subtle I, I mean, distinction. I, I never thought of it. 
Yeah, yeah, I never thought of it, but I think if I have to think about a, a, a distinction there, mild as it may be, I'll have to think about it more, but I would say excellence is being um, the best you can at whatever it is you do. Extraordinary, I would say, is about positioning. So in the marketplace, Extraordinary means you really are better than your competitor. You really are doing it better than your competitor and so on. So I think that could be one distinction is extraordinary is, um, you know, doing things in a way that people look at you and go, wow, that really is distinctive. And, and uh, you know, positioning is about why should people do business with you? How easily can somebody else imitate what you do? Um, so you can have 10 people in a group, all of whom are excellent. They may not all be extraordinary because they, they may all be equal, but the extraordinary one might be the one who shines above all of those people nevertheless. Every person in the Olympic swim meet could be excellent at swimming, but there's one person who's who beats you by one hundredth of one percent of a you know second uh, or split second? That's the extraordinary one who gets the gold medal that day. And I think that could be one. I, distinction. I like that, and I'm certainly going to go back and think about that some more. Maybe we can have a a follow up discussion on that. Nito, thank you very much for being on the show today. It's a pleasure to meet and speak with you, and I I certainly appreciate the value that you've added to our show. And I know there are listeners and viewers will too. And I'm so grateful that you're on the show today. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you very much. And, and keep doing great things because you're I helping a lot of that. people. And to our listeners and viewers, thanks for tuning into Life Excellence. Please support the show by subscribing, sharing it with others, posting about today's show with Dr. Nito Cubain on social media, and leaving a rating and review. You can also learn more about me at brianbardis.com. Until next time, dream big dreams and make each day your masterpiece.